technology. Um, the video conferencing is working, and I'd like to take this opportunity to, for everybody in the room here um, to welcome our colleagues who are patiently waiting. On the left-hand side, we have um, our colleagues in Kaitaia. Hi, Kaitaia. Hi, Kaitaia. <laughs> and on the right-hand side, we have our colleagues from the Mid-North and the Bay of Islands, and maybe some people from Hokianga, I'm not sure. So, hi, Mid-North. <laughs> So um, welcome to you. To you. Uh, this is kind of like a new thing that we're trying, is to um, be able to really spread uh, education out across Northland. To re um, our rural nurses spend a lot of time in cars travelling, and we really want to make that as easy as possible we can, we can. And at the same time, we are recording this, we're hoping. <laughs> Um, which means that um, it will, um, the recording of the session will be available on our website for a limited time. So if any of your colleagues at work have un been unable to attend tonight or in, in the other two places, um, I'll be sending out the link for that. So it's all a bit of an experiment. This all seems to be working, but the microphone doesn't. So it's just as well I've got a really loud voice, and I'm hoping we can make do, but we're, we're kind of trying to fix it was working this afternoon. So um, tonight, um, I really want to welcome you all. We do every year a, a, an update for cervical smear takers. It's not actually compulsory to do, but we feel it's really important to offer this to you and for you to come and um, participate. Um, you should do one every two years. You don't have to do one every year, but every two years at least. And so this is um, why we offer it every year, so you can kind of choose. Um, and I think that tonight we've got a really special uh, group because we, we really love having our local health providers. And tonight we have the whole team, pretty much, <laughs> from the Northland DHB. Many of you will know Eileen, who um, runs the National Screening Unit um, Register, who's here for the first part. That's for the first 15 minutes. Eileen's a stalwart, has been with us for many years, and is also a person that contributes greatly to our smear takers course and, and supporting smear takers. <laughs> so thank you, Eileen, for coming along. Um, we've also got Alison Cullen, and you'll all know Alison from the colposcopy unit, the clinical nurse specialist. Alison's um, a familiar person to us all, and is also um, it's really great to have you back here, Alison. And uh, Dr. Donna Hardy, who was here, I think, a couple of years ago, maybe two or three years ago, um, Donna. So thank you very much for all agreeing to come back and um, really give a local flavour to our, to our evening tonight. So without any further ado, I'm not sure whether the microphone is fixed, but I'll, I will get Eileen. Eileen, if you'd like to come up and we'll make a start. Um, this microphone is working, I'm hoping, so that um, we can get um, it recorded through to the Bay of Islands and the... So where did Jenny go? She's got the... Okay. So Eileen's so going to do a 15-minute presentation. We'll be open for questions after that. Um, and we just need to be aware that Eileen needs to people to speak up. We were going to we were going to put the microphone around for um, so that she's a little bit hard of hearing. So we'll do that at the time. Ah. Might have by then. Hi, Mary. Just from Bay of Islands. Yes. We've, we've got a we've got a lovely view of all of you, but not of Eileen. Okay. We're going to move the camera around now. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Got a lovely view of everybody, but not you. So, oh, okay. So you <laughs> you start, and we'll do that. Okay. Hello, up north. Hi, Eileen. Thank you. Hi. Okay. Yeah. So I'll put the. Um, we're going to just put the um, uh, PowerPoint on. <laughs> 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 so we're going to go over into the content and to the PowerPoint now, people up north, hopefully. 
Ah, yes. <laughs> right, we're away. Well, hello everyone. Um, this is just very short, brief. Probably most of you have seen much of all of this before, but this is my little presentation. Um, so we'll just start. And hello again to those ones up north. Okay, I'm just on those handouts. Those are my, our contact details. They might, you might like to have them in front of you at times. So what's what? It's just our free phone. Oh, I didn't know that sound. Sorry about that. Um, these figures here, when we changed over to the new register back in 2008, these figures there, like as you can see the process and everything else, so this time I asked um, one of the fellows down at the NSU, um, and he's given me these figures for 2013. They're not exactly, um, they don't time exactly, but they'll, they'll give you an idea of what's what. The, you know, how many smears processed, how many cults. Um, lifetime smears for women is 16, <coughs> and the down here, per annum, 170 women diagnosed with invasive cervical cancer back then. And in 2011, 161 diagnosed with um, cancer in New Zealand, and 52 died of cancer in 2010. They're not exact, you can't really compare them exactly, but it just gives you a little bit of an idea. But you can see how many um, colposcopies. That, and he said those ones here include um, private. And I don't know that these ones last time did, so he didn't mention that. And that was Ivan Rowe. He gave me these figures anyway. So, 2013, processing uh, for 433,000 smears. Quite a lot, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Okay. And some more figures. Between 1990 and 2005, it was in 2008, New Zealand, um, the rate of cervical cancer increased by 60%. And in 2013, between 1998 and 2010, so that's only, what, two, 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 well, that's only 12 years, mortality rate from cervical cancer decreased 32%. So I don't really know how you read that, you know, stats, okay? Uh, oh, I meant to do that. <laughs> Now this, um, in um, Northland in 2013, so you people did 13,000 smears, it's quite a number. When I first started doing the register back well, over 10, 12 years ago, and I used to do our local stats, and there would be about eight or 900 a month was about average. So that's increased, so you're really working hard. And um, 660 cops in Northland there. And it includes, and then the whole of the program, um, 7,000 smear takers and 20 DHVs and seven labs. Seven mm -hmm. Okay, here you get the Do you all know what the Register Central team does? They look after the register, they manage records and correspondence, they conduct quality assurance and liaise with regional service sites, and they audit and monitor women outside the guidelines, and they provide first level support for the program and register users, and they manage inquiries, and then they also give us um, tasks to, to sort out locally. Okay, uh, these are the reports that we do, and most of you will be very familiar with all these reports. Screening histories, you often um, ask about, well, I've had notes here, and I'm not really taking any notes of that, sorry. Smear taker recalls, overdue smears, and quality of smears, and they are on request, and you know that you get your um, smear taker recalls monthly on request. Do you know that in Northland, 
it's just about a, a hundred percent the numbers of um, health facilities get those reports and I think that's just absolutely marvellous so congratulations to you all I think there's only about one <coughs> one or two of health facilities in all of Norton don't ask for any of our reports so um, well done all of you <coughs> uh, what do I say okay And in the reports that you get, I receive every month about 70 plus back from you with, with the um, changes in demographics and all sorts of things. So it's quite a number to get through with all the other things. So <coughs> thank you so much for all the work that you do for them, all of you. All of you. Um, and those ones up north too. Got to remember to you. Um, this was a note that I saw for minimum number of attempts to contact a woman for recall is three. It's expected that further efforts will be made where possible. For women who have not responded to recall, opportunistic screening may be appropriate. Women should not be removed or archived from recall lists. So you know when a woman says she doesn't want to have any more smears, well, just keep it there in the background. You never know if she just might want to change, change her mind in time to come. And she, you might find that they do. Do you? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now, the screening history report. Um, it's mostly used on an on-demand basis to supply the operators or health group with, uh, with participant screening history. Now, you're all familiar with those. Um, and we're... Oops, I didn't mean to do that. <coughs> oh. Pressing the wrong buttons, aren't I? Have I gone too far? Oh. Yeah, if you have a look up here, sometimes I wonder whether everybody really knows. That, that's the important one there. Do you look at that when you get those reports? That next expected event? Yeah. That's what you look at to begin with when you ask, you know, when you need to know when the, whether they're overdue or not. And it tells you everything on those reports now, <coughs> like it used to be. And um, as you know, now the screening history includes referral visits and DNAs. It includes all those, so you'll have a good picture of what's gone in her history. And it must be followed by health practitioners. List you women, this is the smear tape and recall. Now it lists the women by the level of abnormality. You, you know it's split up into those different sections. It's automatically generated by the register two months before or to when the participant will be due for her smear and sent out monthly. I think sometimes maybe some practices get a little bit mixed up between the overdues and the recalls. And um, I think uh, that um, this here, and this is an old one, of course. Here we go. That's the due date, and it will be in the future, as you would imagine. And here's your overdue. That last one was a recall report, sorry. It's an opportunity for smear tables to update demographics and other relevant information. Automatically generated by the register and sent out monthly. Now, you know some health practices will only get the overdue report and some prefer to do the, just the recall report. Okay. And um, now, are you familiar with what the register sends out? Their letters. Women with abnormal history will receive a recall letter at three months and six months overdue. And with a normal history, they receive a recall letter at six months and nine months. Oftentimes, too, when I have to make contact with practices and I'm annoying your lovely receptionists who are so busy, it's probably because I have received or some information and we've had letters returned, they've gone no address, and it's because we are really wanting to get out those letters again. When they come back, we regenerate a letter, an overdue letter, once I find out, once we find out the new address. So those hard-working receptionists, yeah, just... But they really are wonderful, anyway. Thank you. And when you get your reports, I think
think I'm just about there. Right? Um, this, this is the envelope that they come in. One enterprising um, health facility uses it and posts them back. And she just, the little cover here, and she puts that, the cover note there with our return address inside that envelope, which I thought was actually quite a good idea. Save on your, um, your stationery. And what else have we got here? Just about there, I think. The overdue. And there's your um, um, quality of smears report. I think you're all familiar with those. They come out every year now. Right. And you know that you can um, ask for them on demand. Okay. And at the last page there, screening matters. Now, hopefully you're all familiar with the screening matters and there's some useful information. And the last one that came through was withdrawals. Did anybody um, check the last screening matters? If you haven't, it would be a good idea to because it really does outline the difference between withdrawal and um, declining smears. Because that's really quite important. Okay? So um, that's it for me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions? If, um, when you say contact them three times, mm -hmm. is that one from us and two from you? No, it's three from you. No. Three yeah. from us, yeah, and then so. you will recall we them? We recall them, we send them, we send two letters, and if they don't, you know, two <coughs> letters, and that's all that the register will, will um, send them, and then they go off our recall. Um, I got the price for the most years, mm -hmm. and what I do is, when I send them the first letter, I put them on a miscellaneous recall that says miscellaneous one, so it distinguishes it from the other recalls. Mm -hmm. Then I will send them an overdue letter mm -hmm. on that next recall in four weeks' time. This is the annual and normal. And then when I get that <coughs> one, I will send another one, another recall with a little X on it, so that I know that one is my phone call one, and I'll ring them up and I'll say, Hi, have you moved? Did you not get my letter? Oh, you did. Would you like to book in for this week? You know, and they're like, oh, blah, blah, blah. And most of the time they'll book in. Sometimes they don't tune up, but at least I know I've nailed it, mate. You can run back. Done. Yeah. So there, if they had three from you or two from us, it's five. It's five. Okay. Um, are there any questions from the mid and far north for Eileen? If you can hear this. Um, Mary was just wondering what the difference is between withdrawing and declining. Did you get that, Eileen? What's the difference With, between withdrawal and decline? When, when, when somebody writes on a report, um, it might be an overdue report and they're saying they want to withdraw, or they have, want no more smears. See this, they can say no more smears. Well, it's, a withdrawal is when all their records are deleted from the register. The only thing that's left is the woman, well the woman wants to withdraw, and all her records come off the register except her demographics. So, you know, she's recognised in case she has another smear and she's not for any more smears to come onto the register. Declining smears um, means that when you say she's declined smears, we need to know, is it permanently declining smears forever? And then we can change the record on the register and she won't get any more letters from us. She's just declined all further smears. It's different from withdrawing. Withdrawing is when all her records are deleted from the register. Okay. okay? Thank, okay. You. Thank you. Thank you. So one more question for Eileen before we move on. I was just going to ask yeah. Eileen, uh, um, yeah. they have to sign a... Um, yeah, what happens now, the woman has to, she um, has to sign a, a withdrawal herself. It doesn't come from the practice. The practice can, can mention that she requests the withdrawal and a letter will be sent to her from the register if she hasn't already got one off the, site, off the website. They, they will stop her um, and wait for her withdrawal signature to come back. Okay. It will get sent to her. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it, Eileen. Thank you. Thank you.
um, Alison, thank you. Uh, are you able to hear at the back? We're really sorry about the microphone. Don't know if that was working this afternoon. And are you hearing us in uh, Bay of Islands and Kaitaia? Yep. yep, we're hearing you well. Great, thank you. So, Just one other I'm question. Not going to risk... Sorry, you got a question? One other question. Can Eric Snowden and Kim.com access our data? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm switching her off now. <laughs> I'm putting, putting Kim.com and cervical smears in the same sentence. Sorry, no, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Might do. <laughs> but um, thank you very much for that very good question. So I'm not going to risk taking you uh, taking off the PowerPoint. So you just have to believe me that we've got this lovely Alison here in front of us now who's going to take on the next session. So thank you, Alison. That's okay. So what we're, Donna and I are going to try to do tonight is cover these subjects and um, a little bit of the Princess trial. We're not quite <coughs> sure whether we'll have time for the wildfire well, conditions one, but um, <coughs> we'll save that for another day if we're running over. So thank you very much for all your suggestions about what we should talk about today. It's really helpful knowing what you need, what you'd like to know about. Um, one of the suggestions was HPV testing. So, and a bit of an update on that. So when you, as a smear taker, when do you um, request the HPV test on a smear? Previous high grade smear. Previous high grade smear. They have to be over don't they? There's two types of testing that you have, isn't there? There's, there's testing, te HPV testing that you request on a smear, yeah. and there's HPV testing that the lab automatically does when certain criteria are met. And that's, sort of, that's called um, the triaging, triaging that the labs do. So for most people, we, you, we would expect you probably to request a high-risk HPV test on somebody that's had a treatment and a treatment for a high grade and when would you do that test? At the time of the smear. Yeah, when, when time frame from the treatment. The treatment is in January. When would you do the, the next smear annual and then the smear after that? Two, so you've got two clear smears. Great, that's great, Robin. That's wonderful. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, my ears are a little bit blocked, but anyway, Sorry. we'll just go. <laughs> we'll just move on. So, test of cure. That's the, that's within three years of treatment. Okay. Well, we'll go through it. We're just going to go through it again. So, the test of cure. So, within three years of a treatment for a high grade. Okay. So. Colposcopy treatment of high grade disease. Then six months later, we will follow up in the colposcopy clinic with um, colposcopy and cytology. If there's no abnormalities or anything like that, then we're going to discharge the woman back into your care. So, six months after our last, the last colposcopy, which will usually be round about the 12 months from the treatment you're going to take a smear and you're going to request a high-risk HPV <coughs> test. Okay? So then, when the results come back, if the high-risk HPV test and the cytology is negative, then you're going to do another smear in 12 months' time requesting high-risk HPV test <coughs> and cytology. And if both of those come back as normal, so you've had two consecutive um, negative results, then that woman can return to the three-year screening program. And can I ask, do you want any further HPV testing once they return to the three-year screening? No, no. The standards are quite clear that at this stage, if she's had two consecutive <laughs> negative cytology, negative HPV, then she can return to three-year screening and just a smear. Okay. So if there's an abnormality, when you do your um, smears at either point, either at the one year post-treatment or the two years post-treatment, then it's referred back to colposcopy. So either with a positive cytology, negative cytology and a positive high-risk HPV, or um, positive, but okay, back to colposcopy clinic. Okay. 
Okay? Quite clear? So then... Are we able to get a copy of this? I've got it here for you. I've got the, the, the stand, the um, NCSP st um, flow chart for you, so I'll pass it out. And um, we will be putting these on the website. Um, <coughs> are there handouts for this one? Uh, no, I didn't do that. Okay. So I've got, I've got the, um, <coughs> no, that's the flow charts to hand out. Yeah, so it'll be um, available after the session. So that's the recent treatment. So when, when else do you want, what else? When else would you start thinking about maybe HPV testing somebody? Somebody has been on years, years for a long time. That's right. That's had treatment maybe about seven or eight years ago, and they've coming coming back regularly for their um, annual smears. And you'd quite like to try perhaps get them back onto the um, three yearly program. And of course, they've had no, uh, they've had normal smears in that point in time. Sorry, that's my HPV. Do we have to get consent from them to do that? I should think so. I mean, I think it's for everything. You have to ask people if they want to do that. Don't you? Yeah, There's nothing... The screening book it is. is there anything? Mm. Does it? Yeah. <coughs> oh, good. Some people don't want to. They want to say on you. Well, it's... You have to get consent for the HPV test before the lab will do it. It's from the labs that said you have to have consent for the HPV test and you have to discuss it with the lady. So is it a written consent or a verbal consent? Mm -hmm. The best consent. Mm -hmm. No, that's got... Uh, there is no... Donna, there's no age no, restriction on that. Anybody who's had treatment. Yeah, anybody that's had historical treatment. So it's over three years. Yeah. This is different for the triage test. Yeah. This is a test of pure and somebody who's been treated for a high grade mm -hmm. yeah. And they can be 20 or they can be 70. So the, the triage test is, is over 30 with a low grade cytology. And you don't request that at all. That is the, the lab decide to do yeah. will decide to do that because they've got the low grade cytology. So again, if you get if you choose if someone chooses wants to go back onto the three yearly program, then again she needs two negative cytology and HPV. Um, with 12 months in between there. So two consecutive ones, and then she can return to the um, yearly screening program. And what's changed is this one. I won't use the pointer because I've pressed the wrong button. Is initially people were being referred back to colposcopy clinic with normal cytology and a high risk HPV. Okay? <coughs> Um, with a historic treatment. Okay, so now what you can do is actually you can just keep screening them yearly until, until you get two consecutive <coughs> normals, but they both have to be normal. Does that make sense? Yes. Right, okay, good. That's good. And again, if there's anything. Oh, perfect, thank you. If at any, at any stage the cytology becomes abnormal again, um, then you refer to colposcopy clinic. Okay. Now, I don't know, do you get your HPV result with yeah. your smear? It always comes back together. There's not a delay between the two. Sometimes it doesn't. You said the reason why I'm so wide doesn't get done. Sorry, I'll get some different Sometimes it's an amendment. Oh, right. Right. So you do sometimes have to wait. Do you? Yeah. Yeah. Excuse me while I'm supping on this. Um, so those are really the only times that we're asking you to request HPV. Don't it, do we sometimes at the at the MDM are we are do we ever ask the practice nurses to do a high risk HPV or do we tend no, to do them usually, ourselves? Usually we would request it from the laboratory on the smear. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was just wondering. Sometimes from MD, we use sometimes we use the HPV test in a slightly different way for management of um, women with slightly tricky cases and we would sort of maybe do a HPV test <coughs> at other times as well, but we obviously I can't remember whether we asked you to do it or not. 
So that's the HPV. Is that, so any questions about that? <coughs> so, sorry, sorry, we've got a question from Bay of Islands. Oh, sorry, sorry, guys. Yep. Um, but do you do HR, HPV testing on vault spheres with a previous high grade? On vault spheres? Well, in theory, if they've, had, if they've been treated for a previous dysplasia and you're doing annual cytology, oh, yeah. yes, you could, you could try doing an HR, HPV test. Thank you. <coughs> so how do I do that? So did you did you hear that? Yes, we did. Thank you. Um, so the next thing we're, we're going to talk, I'm going to just give you some little bits of uh, snippets of information, really is about immunisation and other people are getting really, really interested in, in HPV immunisation now because of the, um, for example, the ENT people are now really excited that they, they may have an immunisation to um, reduce the esophageal, laryngeal cancers and those sorts of things too. So they're really into um, promoting um, the HPV vaccine. And I thought we'd just put this slide up, which just tells us, shows us how, um, how you know, it, it's just, if, well, I'm losing track here. Um, the, the vaginal and gynae cancers um, um, are HP specific, and so also the ENT cancer. And if, and if you ever want to really go to a really interesting talk, then um, perhaps um, you should get Dr. Shetty to. If any, has anybody heard him talk? He's a really, really, really entertaining, interesting talk on oropharyngeal cancers and um, and the HPV effect. So the news about immunisation is that there are new vaccines being developed all the time. There's, um, in particular, vaccines which include some of the other high-risk HPVs. Um, these first two up here. And um, they may provide um, a more comprehensive protection against um, multiple HPV types. There's also um, therapeutic vaccines being researched at the moment, and also the two-dose vaccines. And I think it's, I think Gardasil are looking. Is it Gardasil? Because Cervirix is two doses. <laughs> And Gardner's, Gardner's is three, and I think Gardner is looking at a two-dose one, which may be um, a little bit more pleasant for people. Well, cheaper too. And cheaper, yeah. Um, and some interesting things that we, we went to um, a colposcopy conference last weekend, and there was some interesting news from Australia. Um, that they were finding in some areas that there is a drop-off in screening smears for the immunised young woman. So, I mean, maybe that's something that we should look at if, 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 to see whether we're actually finding that same sort of pattern here. And um, even though when these women, young women have gone through the, um, you know, been immunised and we've done the talk about you still need to be on the screening programme, um, it does seem to have gone in one ear and out the other for a proportion of them, proportion of them anyway. 
and um, and it were ten percent of under twenty fives in a Facebook survey thought they didn't need to be vaccinated. So something to, to think about and be aware of. Um, and women will benefit from regardless of vaccination if they're older. It has been shown to um, be effective in reducing, um, there's a little peak in older women, around about 40 to 50, where there's an increase in um, HPV infection, and it may well benefit those women. And also benefit women um, who have been treated um, for high-grade lesions. And one of the trials um, states that the rates of recurrence are reduced by about 48%, which is good. And if somebody, if a woman can actually afford to have, to pay for Gardasil, then she will benefit, it will mm -hmm. provide some benefit. For so are you guys offering it to people with high grades and got and colposcopy clinics? We're not, to them? we're not offering it to them, but we are talking to them about it. <coughs> We can't offer it because we don't have it. No. But we, but we will talk to anybody who's been treated for high grade, especially if they're under about 45, and suggest that they can reduce their chances of having the same problem again yeah. if they have a vaccine. Yes. But they can hope, so they've got to make a decision about whether they have it or not. And mostly $450 tends to put them off. Yeah, yeah, it does. And, it's not, and the ones that we would most like to have it will, will, will be least likely to be Yeah. I mean, Gardasil is approved from 9 to 45. Sorry? It's approved to give between. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Donna? It's got the med safe approval yeah. up to the age of Yeah. So you can't give it at 55. Yeah, you can, but you're giving it off schedule. Yeah. Oh, okay. So that's something to think about. So, as I've got the cold, I'll make you work a bit more. Um, is there anything that you want to... Sorry, I have to keep asking. Do you have anything you want to ask in Kaitaia or the Mid-North? No, we're good. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so... Um, 22-year-old comes to your clinic um, for his smear, and you do the smear, and comes back as sing to, and you have a look back in her notes, and she's had uh, three doses of Gardasil. So, why is that? What are you going to tell her? She's been vaccinated. She's not going to get sing to. She may not have seroconverted. Somebody said someone said she may have already had it. Was she sexually active before she had the vaccine? So, yeah, so was she sexually active before she had the vaccine? Um it is a hundred it is a hundred percent effective in women who have not been exposed to HPV. So the vaccine will prevent 16 and 18 the women who haven't been exposed to the disease. Okay. So what else did you say? Could it be one or the other? Could be one another time. Yeah. Yeah. So have you come across people? Mm -hmm. How many different types of ATs for does HPV cover? How, how, many, how many types of HPV does Gardasil cover? Four. Oh. Okay, which ones does it cover? 16, 18, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, Eight, six and eleven, eight and eleven. Yes. Yeah, Those are the ones that call that are the primary um, genital warts, HPVs. Okay. And then sixteen and eighteen are the high risk HPVs. So there's another 
10, 11, 12 other high risk HPVs, which are not as common, not as common, and 16 and 18 are, are regarded as the most oncogenic as far as cervical cancers are concerned. So it will 16 be more than 18. And it's 100% effective against those four cancers. If yeah. they're yeah. 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 not being exposed prior. Yeah. So you would think at 11, <laughs> if we were giving it to the girls at 11, we're hoping mm -hmm. that we're getting quite a good cross section of girls vaccinated before they're exposed to it. Yeah, and, but some of them that you're giving, you're giving it to are older. Yeah. 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 yeah, but if they're getting it a little So how does that work for the so older ones that have already had treatment? For the older ones, it, it, doesn't, it just doesn't give it the 100% protection. It gives a degree of protection and cross protection for the other high risk HPV. <coughs> so you're never going to say to a woman that there's going to, she's going to be 100% covered if she's been treated, but she's going to have some cover for some HPVs. And you've got to remember, she might have been treated for a high grade lesion, and if, that, if we had HPV tested it, it might have been HPV 31. Mm -hmm. So if, you, if we're giving her the Gardasil, then we're reducing her chances of having a lesion that is 16 and 18. The other thing too, Alison, is that natural immunity, you get very little um, natural immunity from having an infection with 16 or 18, so antibody levels are almost negligible. So you can actually be reinfected with 16 and 18 again, after, if, even if you've been treated. So she meets a new partner, she can still get the same 16 back again that she had before. But if we vaccinate her again 16 and 18, then she won't. Well, she's less likely to be No guarantees. No guarantees. No guarantees. So, oh, can I shut oh, just, just very quickly. Okay, the other thing that we, um, we were asked to talk about was smear taking in pregnancy. And really, um, we just want to say that it's, it is safe in pregnancy. You don't need to, to um, take smears on people that have been regularly screened, normal um, smears. It's not essential that you, have, you do it in the pregnancy, especially if the woman doesn't particularly want it. But if a woman turns up and she's 30 and she's pregnant and she's never had a smear, then, you know, why not do it if she's, if she's willing? Um, and, um, but so then you don't stay to rest pregnancy? Yeah, All really hard later on because, you know, you've got that estrogen effect, you've got the, mm -hmm. if you can find the cervix mm -hmm. later on, it's quite hard and you've got those floppy vaginal walls which get in the way and, um, and everything too. Oh. So it doesn't matter whether you're first trimester, it wouldn't matter? Wouldn't matter. Oh, no, yeah. um, you just remember that there's the, um, the cervix is a lot more vascular then, oh, so yeah. sometimes it's a little bit of bleeding. Yeah. And um, it also looks really different. Yes. So um, just bear that in mind. <laughs> but I've left a naught out in one of these anyway, but that, oh, I'll put it back in again. Um, cervical ca cancer in pregnancy is rare, okay? So smear taking is safe. Um, women should be screened as recommended by the program. Um, and again, if she's never had a if she's never had a smear, then take a smear. Just remember, it does look different in pregnancy. And most in, one of the most important things is to make sure you write on the form that the person is pregnant, because then the, the cytologists are going to look at the the, um, the thin prep differently, and there may be false positives. So how do you get around explaining that to a pregnant woman? What? That false positives and negatives due to pregnancy changes. How do you explain false positives and negatives um, when you're taking mm -hmm. a smear from an... Um, oh, so if they ever get... That's not always foolproof if they get any yeah, symptoms. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but, um, you know, just to be aware that, that it, there may be some there. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's just the, it's just the estrogen changes on the cervix of the horse face. Well, that's a really good idea. Okay. <laughs>
And so I thought I'd just go over some of the things, some of the ways of describing the cervix, so that rather than just sending us a letter that says it looks abnormal, you can give us a little bit of an idea as to what you've seen. It gives us an idea then as to how rapidly we need to see them in clinic. So we'll just talk first a little bit about where the transformation zone is and Remember, a lot of, lots of people, especially the medical students who I ask this question, they say, well, it's where the, the uh, columnar epithelium meets the squamous epithelium, so it's there. But that's not, of course, that's the squamo-columnar junction, isn't it? And that's only one area of the transformation zone. And what you remember is that uh, when we're born, the squamo-columnar junction on a female uh, baby is way out there, right out laterally, peripherally on the cervix. And then under the influence of hormones and moving around and all kinds of things, you get squamous epithelium growing over the top of that columnar epithelium. So it's transformed. It's transformed from columnar to squamous 
And that area, because it continues to change and undergo this word up here, metaplasia, that's the area that's vulnerable to HPV. So that's the area where you're going to develop precancerous abnormalities, those two purple bits on each side, and that's the area that you have to take a smear from. So it's not just the squamocolumnar junction. When you put your cervi broom in, that's what you'll see on the cervix. You'll see where it goes from being pink to being red. But actually, those little bristles on the cervi broom, they have to spread out wide and cover all of that area right out. Otherwise, you're not going to get pick up the uh, tissue that you need to. So the, when, you, when you have a smear and it says there's no endocervical cells, the laboratory are worried that you might have just taken it from there, but you haven't actually taken it from an area that means you've covered the whole transformation zone centrally. What they can't tell you is whether you've covered it out far enough. They can only test to see whether you've covered the inner aspect of the transformation zone. So when we, can you see that? How does it look up there? Is it a bit blurry? Yeah. Ah, that's lovely. Thank you. So when you're looking at the cervix, this is columnar epithelium in here, bright red, and it's bright red because the blood vessels are close to the surface in that area. Looks frondy, it looks like a sea anemone. And this is all squamous epithelium out here. Now this is a colposcopic picture, of course. It's never going to look like that to you guys, unless you've got a colposcope. But we can tell where the transformation zone ends because it's the most peripheral aspect where the, we see those gland openings, or those crypts, they're called. And it's way out here. Yeah, on that one? Way out there. The broom does usually cover out that far. Sometimes it doesn't. And you know, sometimes you'll get patients where that squamocolumnar junction is up here, off the screen somewhere or other. Yeah? So there's no point in screening and smearing in the centre because you're not going to get any squamous cells, are you? You have to smear way, way out on the edge. Otherwise, you'll get a report back that says insufficient squamous cells. So again, on this one, uh, Os in the centre, nice uh, squamocolumnar junction there, and <coughs> way out around there, you see almost like a kind of white line. That's, that's the furthest extent. So when you're describing something, remember first of all that that's the anatomical position, that's how we describe everything. So standing front on, anterior, doesn't matter about the hands, you know, to describe them to me. Um, <laughs> so anything, anything that's facing forwards, so on the cervix, is going to be the anterior lip. If they're lying on their back, is the one that's facing up. So the one underneath the symphysis pubis is the anterior, whether they're lying on their back, on their front, on their side, wherever. Okay. So the top one, if they're lying in lithotomy, for example, or they've just drawn their knees up on a plinth, the top part of the cervix is the anterior part. So, same thing, anterior, posterior, lateral, out to the side. And then you know the difference between, we'll just go back, between uh, medial, means it's closer into the centre, lateral means it's further out to the side. We don't need to do proximal and distal and cervixes. Is it good to use a, um, the clock? That, yeah, I'm just going to get on to that. We will do that. The clock's a really good way of doing it. So if you, if you think of 12 o'clock as being on the ante in the middle of the anterior lip, and then going around like on a clock face is good for telling us where the position is. So when you're talking about anything pathological, in fact, but when you're describing the cervix, there's a number of things that you can tell us about. You can tell us about the number of abnormalities you've seen, you can tell us what colour they are, you can tell us the position of them, and that's where you can use the clock face if necessary. Then the surface contour, whether they're rough or smooth, the outline, the size, and anything else. So we'll go through those one at a time. So be precise about the number. If it's just one thing you can see, that's good. If there's lots of them, don't just say multiple. Tell, tell us whether it's more than 10, less than 10, something like that. Yeah? The colour, of course, red, dark red, pink, white, black, 
Blake in particular, we want to know. <coughs> Again, that anterior, posterior, lateral, or use the clock face. Tell us whether it's right in the centre, if it's in the os, or if it's on the periphery of the cervix, out wide. Because if you use the clock face, I <coughs> can't tell whether that's in the canal or if it's three o'clock, you know, way out there somewhere. And do tell us whether it's in the canal. That's helpful to know. So when you're thinking about the surface contour, I want to know whether this is raised up above the surface of the cervix, so it's something that's protruding, protruding or whether it's just flat and it's just a change in the colour, but it's quite flat. Sometimes it can be depressed, kind of in a hollow. It can be ulcerated, you know, where the whole top seems to have come off it and it looks raw. It can be quite smooth or it can be rough. And sometimes if you're looking at something like a cervical wart, it'll look frondy. Oh. Yep. <coughs> and then the outline of it, whether it's a smooth, very clearly demarcated outline or if it just seems to spread diffusely. And the size is really, it's really helpful for us if you can tell us how big it is. And the way that I do it when I'm doing colposcopy is that I use a cotton bud to measure it, and one of those, you know a cotton bud that you'd take a chlamydia swab with? Mm -hmm. Yep, one of those is about half a centimetre wide. Mm -hmm. Yep. So if you work out whether this is, you know, three cotton buds wide or ten cotton buds wide, it'll give you some idea as to what size it is. Cause, because, well for me anyway, looking down the colposcope, it looks huge, and if I don't have a swab there next to it, I'm going to overestimate the size, and you're probably going to underestimate the size. The other things we need to know about is whether there's any kind of exudate on it, you know, does it bit, look a bit slimy and yucky? Is it bleeding? And any of you who have ever looked after women who've got a cervical cancer will know that there's a very distinctive smell to a cervical cancer. So, you know, if you're looking at the cervix and you see something awful and there's a horrible smell as well, then, then that's a good thing to describe. So here we go. Who's going to give us a chance? I, don't, I want hands up. Who can tell me the number? The number of what? Number of abnormalities on that cervix. Two. No, probably just that one in the centre. Okay. So that's not a transformation zone. That's actually something popping out of the cervix. What about the discoloration on the left hand side? In there, no, it's probably just an old bit of blood or something like that. That's okay. So we're just practicing the description here. So we'll say there's just one. What colour? Red. Red. Okay. What position? Central. Yep. Well, and protruding from the os. Thank you. Very good. Is it raised? Yes. Yes, it's raised. Is it smooth? Surface contour? Yes, yeah, smooth. Is it... We all demarcated the other. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that's good. And you can't tell the other things. Donna, yeah. Yep. Polyps, like um, I twisted a few off on the instructions of the doctor. Is there guidelines for doing that in New York? Well, really, you need to know whether it's on a little thin stalk or or not. And most of them uh, are on a little thin stalk. And when you put the polyp force upon, you can tell they're easily going to twist off. If you put the polyp force of on and you give a twist and it doesn't seem to move, then leave it alone. Take the polyp force of off. <laughs> That's about it, really. Uh, okay, can anybody describe this cervix then? So, can you see any abnormalities? It's a cheat, really, because this is probably a normal cervix, but it's again, it's a colposcopic picture. Yeah, that's right. So here's the squamocolumnar junction round here. Yeah. Yeah. It's quite wide, though, isn't it? It's way down here on the posterior lip. This is all columnar epithelium in here, and these these cavities and crevasses are, are just normal what happens in columnar epithelium. Age. But, yeah, but, well, no, not really. It's probably a very young cervix more than anything. We always tell our patients their cervix never get wrinkles, but <laughs> the only bit of it doesn't wrinkle. Um, but if you were describing 
describing that in a letter, you know, if you'd looked at that and you were worried about that, then probably the thing that would worry you most would be the exudate over the surface yeah. of it, wouldn't yeah. it? You know, yeah. look, it is just normal mucus, but but uh, everything else is okay, the colour's okay, and and you could say that that was concentric, it went right round the whole of the os. You could measure it, and then you could describe to me what the exudate was like. So there's a little Nebothian cyst in here. There's probably another one and underneath there. It's not such a good picture. But if you, this is the thing that most commonly we see. People refer us, they say, I looked at the cervix and there's these lumps all over it. And um, can you have a look at it? It looks really abnormal. And Nebothian cyst would be the most common referral. But if you describe that to me, then I'd get some idea that that's what I was going to deal with here. Yeah? Because there may be three of them there, but we'll say there's one, okay? And then the next thing you're going to tell me is the colour. Oh. Yeah, and they're, they range from being white to a kind of yellowy colour. Sometimes as they, because they're just mucus retention cysts, so it's just where the gland opening's um, sealed over, and so the mucus is collected in underneath. They sometimes can get quite big, and I've certainly seen them where they can be maybe three or four centimetres across, so quite large. Um, they can be really huge, and they can obscure the os. So you're going to tell me about the colour, then you're going to tell me where it is. Yep, so in that one there, it's probably going to be at about two o'clock, but very close to the os, isn't it? Quite medial on the cervix, or quite central close to the squama columnar junction, but they can be out a long way because, as you know, the transformation zone can extend a long way out on the cervix too. But the other thing that you're going to tell me is that it's really smooth over the top. Yeah. <coughs> and, it, and it's usually quite well demarcated. Sometimes you'll see blood vessels stretched out over the top of them, won't you? So, oh, that's normal. No, that's normal. Leave them alone. They go away on their own. Sometimes, though, you can get lots of them. Yeah. And you see in this one here, you've got one there, one there, and there, all over. There's hundreds of them probably on that cervix all the way around. And you see how they, they kind of distort the blood vessel pattern a bit. They make them look much more prominent. But if you look at each of those blood vessels, they kind of branch pretty normally. You know, like a tree branches. They go from being a big trunk to gradually getting smaller and smaller. So that's just a very inflamed cervix. You didn't describe that properly. You called it multiple. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I know, but then I said there's probably hundreds on there. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite right, Alison. <laughs> Okie dokie. So that's what we need to know about uh, about describing the cervix. Um, that tra the A1 transformation zone. I just want to show you a picture just talking about metaplasia. And this, this has come from a presentation that Alison and I went to at the weekend. And there were just some great <coughs> pictures of, of what happens to the cervix under the influence of hormones. And uh, so if I can find the right pictures on it. That, yeah, that's, that's it. That's good. Let's see. Oh, they have them twisted around. Can I turn that up? Can you turn them up the right way? Um, oh, no. We'll be right. I'll just get to the right one first, Mary. Uh, yeah, that one if we can. Yeah, they rotate view. Yeah, good. Thank you. <coughs> Clockwise. Lovely. Thank Ooh. you. Okay, ma'am. Well, so thank you, Mary. <laughs> but there'll be another one. Don't go away. all those other things there, but that's fine. No, that's fine. Is that okay? Very good. Yeah. yeah. So you see here, this is quite a wide ectropion, isn't it? The columnar epithelium is quite a long way out on the cervix. Yep. So this is the same woman, uh, 12 months apart. Yep. This is when she first came in as a teenager, and then I think 12 months or two years. And you see, you can still see the... Um, squama columnar junction out here, but you see these fingers of, mm, yeah. of white, and that's squamous epithelium growing in over the top already. And then 
in this particular patient, way, way out here, on the oral contraceptive pill, so that everts the, the columnar epithelium onto the outside of the cervix, and then she decided that she'd have an IECD put in, same cervix, that to that. Take away the pill, that's what happened. That's doesn't take long. No. Doesn't take long for that to happen, you know, between going off the extra estrogen and onto that. Now that brings me on to one of the questions that came from a uh, practice nurse who couldn't come tonight, and that is, uh, hang on, I should just read it out. No, I won't. Left it down the back there. Um, how many times can you have no endocervical cells on a smear before you have to refer them on? Now, uh, I, that's all I know about the particular person. I don't know whether they're postmenopausal or premenopausal, but... If you've got no endocervical cells, it means that you haven't sampled any columnar epithelium in there. So um, if she's premenopausal, then my advice would be to try and take a smear mid-cycle, around ovulation time, and you're more likely to pick up columnar epithelium. If she's postmenopausal, then if you give her some estrogen from having a squamocolumnar junction way up the endocervical canal somewhere, you'll bring it down the canal and, and hopefully onto the ectocervix and you might be able to pick up the... Just, yeah, just Overston, or oral. Yeah, Overston, yeah, or oral, either. You'd, I'd try with Overston first because she's not going to get any kind of bleeding then. Um, if, uh, I think in that particular patient she had a history of high grade, I think, wasn't it on the bit of paper, Alison? But um, yes. Yes. so so she may her anatomy on her cervix may be altered just by the fact that she's had some treatment. So in that biopsy. sorry, cone biopsy. Cone, cone biopsy. So that she, her cervix will be distorted. The squamocolumnar junction may well be quite some way up the canal. So make sure that you use a cyto brush to sample the endocervical canal. And if that, you know, so cytobrush plus some estrogens, and if you still can't get endocervical cells, then you're not going to get them, probably. But if the cervix looks normal, then that's good. And the, the current program says you don't have to have endocervical cells. Once upon a time, you used to have to refer them if you had two without endocervical cells. Now it says if the <coughs> cervix looks normal, then you don't need to refer them. And that's the only time you would use a brush? Yeah, it's the only time I use a brush. Thank Somebody's you. had a cone. Yep. Alison, sorry. <laughs> um, we got a referral in today, and um, in a special referral that a, they used a uh, cyto brush, spatula, and soda broom to take the smear. Do, we re do they really need to use... I wonder what order they used them in. That'd be interesting, <laughs> wouldn't it? Because, yeah, especially with the spatula, you could wipe off a lot yeah. of cells that yeah. you would otherwise be aiming to pick up with your survey brew. Yeah. I don't, I, I think we've still got spatulas, but I can't remember the last time I used one. Um, so survey broom and cyto brush would usually pick up enough. And do your survey broom first. And then take your cyto brush smear from up the canal. And that's only if you've got someone who, where you can't see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. And I wouldn't do it. Usually, the only people I do it on are people who I'm really worried about something way up the canal. So people who've had uh, AIS before, you know, adenocarcinoma in situ, or somebody who I've had uh, been able to pick up endocervical cells on. So I wouldn't do it as a routine for anybody. Only in that, only in response to those situations. Mostly, you can get them with the cervi brew. Those are quite long, those. You know, and if you push it hard enough against the cervix to flatten out the, the thing, you've gone quite a long way up the canal. Yeah, that's really. Have we got any other questions at the moment? How about you guys up north? Any other questions? Gone to sleep. <laughs> okay, so that's all I wanted from you. And you and Yeah, yeah, princess. Yeah, princess. So I don't. Um, does everybody know about the princess trial that we that our hospital's taking part in? Yeah. 
No. Okie dokie. Some of you will have had letters back because some of your patients may be enrolled in it. Um, it's, a, it's a multinational trial, in fact, um, but mostly we're recruiting in New Zealand. And what it is is a trial uh, about uh, the conservative management of CIN2 in young women, so in women under the age of 25. And so it's called Princess because that comes from prediction of regression of CIN2, and then they just added the ESS on the end because it looked pretty. <laughs> That's uh, Princess Margaret's tiara. Oh, I like that one. So is that. <laughs> she has lots of colour in her tiaras. So the coordinating centre for this trial is actually in Christchurch and um, with uh, Peter Sykes and Bryony Simclock and the main uh, investigators. Mostly in New Zealand, uh, Sydney and Melbourne are just joining in and um, the aim is to recruit 600 women under the age of 25 who've got histologically proven CIN2. And um, so our numbers are now over 300 and... Whangarei have got six in that trial, so we're doing all right. Not going to come back to bite you in 20 years' time. We hope not, like. no. <laughs> yeah. so, um, so the eligible women have got histologically proven CIN2, so not just on a smear. They may actually be referred to us with a low-grade smear, but when we do their biopsies, we find that it's CIN2. Uh, the women... Uh, have to be quite well selected because we must know that they're going to come back because we're not treating CIN2. So they've got to come back for their six monthly colposcopy and at that time we do a smear, a biopsy and another HPV test and they've got to be there for the full two years. If we lose them, then they're actually registered as a serious adverse event. So we may be recruiting you guys to chase them up if we can't find them. If they, if they shift, and young women under the age of 25 <laughs> shift a lot, as you know, if they're within New Zealand, they may well be going to another hospital where they're also participating in the trial, and we can swap all of the data over. And a couple of our patients have actually come to us from elsewhere. So they get an HIV um, we high, do it. We high grade do. too, yep. and you guys are going to test them again at six if it's high grade. Yeah, we'll, okay. we'll go on to it in a minute. So if the CIN2 regresses during the two years of the trial, then they'll, they go back to you guys for normal kind of follow-up. But actually, by the time we've seen them at six months, we've got to see them for two appointments to make sure it's still not there. It's just about the two years anyway. If the CIN2 is still present at the end of their two years, they get treated. And if at any stage we find evidence of CIN3, they get treated. That's quite a nice TR too, I think. <laughs> so why are we doing this trial and why it's why is important? Well, first of all, we've got to know, we need to know that not managing CIN2 is safe. Currently, the guidelines say that we should treat CIN2 in anybody over the age of 20. But from worldwide studies, we know that more than 60% will regress if you just leave them alone. And we're really concerned about <coughs> over-treating, just like Herb Green was when he did his study, CIN3. But we know that, um, that if you take lots of tissue out of the cervix with repeated kind of treatments over somebody's reproductive lifetime, you can actually affect the way that the cervix works. And, and so we don't want to treat unnecessarily. If we get CIN3, no matter who we see, we're going to treat it, but, but CIN2 we probably don't need to. Now keep in mind also that there's plenty of countries in the world who don't even take a smear before a woman gets to 25. That includes England, not Scotland, but England, <laughs> Holland, who don't start till 30, and Australia, who are just going to go to 25. Are we looking at it, aren't we, at increasing the age? We may well do. Yeah, if we, we go to primary it. HPV screening, we probably will. But... So, so just keep that in the back of your mind when you're worrying about the CIN2 that we're not treating. And the reason is that this is not a, pro this is not a rapidly progressing disease, you know? CIN, HPV to CIN takes years, 
and CIN to invasive malignancy takes years, and most people too. Um, and if we go to primary HPV screening, we certainly will be screening from an older age. But one of the things that can inform us as to whether that's a safe thing to do will be this trial, because we'll see how many people actually get CIN3 or how many people um, recover without any kind of treatment. That's what we hit, what happened when they were screening under the age of 20, didn't it? Found yeah, quite often. absolutely. We've had stacks and stacks of CI in three in teenagers, and but you gone. don't need to treat it. No. No. So it's hope we're going to also get information on HPV types and their prevalence and data and perhaps be able to use that HPV type uh, as uh, a predictor of se disease severity. Uh, we might also get some information on the lesion size because when we colposcope them, we have to describe the lesion and how big it is. And so that might tell us which ones we're safe to leave and which ones we should treat because we already have some pretty good data to suggest the bigger the lesion, the more likely it is to become invasive. And uh, because they're doing some other biomarker tests, we might be able to use that for a prediction of disease progression as well. But those things are all secondary to the primary aim, which is to determine the safety of the conservative management of CIN2 in women under the age of 25. Okie dokie. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. No, that's the last Yeah, no, there's the other role of stuff if we need it. So there's just questions for Donna. Um, before we have a short break for the last half hour, um, including mid and far north and Kaitaira, have you got any questions for Donna? That's great. Sneeze postpartum. Yep. When? Oh, probably not before six to eight weeks. Six to eight weeks. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It takes that long to lose the physiological changes of pregnancy. Used to be three weeks. Yeah. Yeah. Well. If you've got somebody who you, who, you know, you want to get them spared because they're overdue or whatever, six to eight minutes will be fine. What's your question? Oh, did I have a call? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Has there been ever a trial? Is this the first trial, time for this trial? Is there a trial that's booked by any other country? Is there a question from up north? Oh, we're just yeah. we're just wondering if this is the um, first trial that's ever been done with CIN2, or if other countries done trials like this. No, other countries have done it before too, but it hasn't been done in New Zealand. And because we have to be changing our national guidelines, we really need to know that it's a safe thing to do here with our population and with our HPV types. <laughs> Because our Thank HPV you. types might not actually be the same as the rest of the world, and and we don't really have prevalence data on uh, New Zealand's HPV types, but the few little bits that we have got um, looks like 16 and 18 might not necessarily be the prevalent types here. Uh, thank you. And okay. Can you confirm, Alison, please? Did you say we shouldn't be using a brush on a cervix? Uh, that we can see the transformation zone on? Um, well, I don't think you do any harm by doing so. I think use the survey broom first, and then you can take a cyto brush if, if you wish to. But mostly if you can see the squamocolumnar junction, you probably don't need to use a cyto brush. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. <coughs> What's Thank the problem much, if we do use a presentation? So we've got um, one last part. It's a half an hour. There's going to be a little bit of interaction with you here, um, so that you're not all going to go to sleep. But we will finish by eight o'clock, so um, we'll definitely do that. So, any, does anyone need to get a drink or anything, or we just plough on? Plough on. Plow on. <laughs> <laughs> So, without any further ado, I'd like to introduce Jenny Barrett. Many of you will know Jenny, our um, lovely um, um, person who is now doing the cervical smear screening coordination. Is that the title? <laughs> <laughs> um, she 
Because I'm really hit, so I can't remember which one this is. I'm clinical support coordinator. There you go. Probably just the idea of what I do. <laughs> it's there you go. So I'm going to hand over to you now, Jeanette. Thank you. Right. Okay, so um, Mary and I, being both from field and decided that we'd work together on this. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to cover briefly a few things that I have uncovered while I've been ferreting around for some information on good ideas for communicating with our target group and then Mary's <coughs> going to whip into some activities because we think that you're all incredible fonts of wisdom and you'll have some great ideas for us all. <laughs> so um, just quickly covering some things that you already know I'm sure. Um, the ministry have recently added the cervical screening as a target for um, our current year and our goal is 80% or more of all eligible women and we're continuing to um, to provide funding for the priority group women. Um, these are some things that we have planned coming up. Uh, there's a data matching project underway with the NSU. We don't currently have a time frame around that so when we know a bit more we'll be in touch. Uh, We'd like to do some more work on promotion too to try and um, get the woman flocking to you for their smears, as I'm sure they And yeah, just clarifying our priority population. Yeah. So. <laughs> Um, <laughs> as I've mentioned, I've been ferreting around for some information and some, some research that might give us some ideas about the best ways of communicating with the women that we're trying to coerce in for our smears. Um, and I uncovered a research report um, that was put together for the EBCU a little while ago and it was designed to inform their communication plan. But what they did was gather up a hundred women and do some focus groups with them and get some responses from them. And from that research, they looked at commonalities between the responses and they created some little types. So, so we have the fatalists, top left. Um, so, for them, it's all about the fear factor and they don't really want to know if something's wrong. They imagine the worst case scenario, um, they're often older women and they might be feeling cut off or alone. The organisers, on the far right there, are often busy mums with not very much time to think about things and they're the type of person who will put their, um, their family's needs before their own. Um, the acceptors have weighed up all the odds and done lots of. Um, <laughs> he looks a bit like he's got a wedding veil on. <laughs> um, the acceptors have weighed up the odds and like to live in the present no matter what that might entail. Um, they have confidence in their health and they look after themselves. The informed dissenters have done a whole heap of research. They've made their decision and they've considered all the factors and they might have decided that cervical screening is not for them. Um, and that group resent um, challenges to their thinking. So, in dealing with these women of these different types, and I'd just like to acknowledge that I know we're dealing with individuals and everyone's different, um, but I'm just looking at this as a way of coming up with some, some means of communicating with women who, who might fit, even if loosely, within these categories. So the fatalists respond really well to a gentle approach, and scare tactics will just freak them out and make them run away. The organisers respond 
well to the idea of staying healthy for other people and they're the kind of person if you send them a letter saying come here and do this now then they, they might respond quite favorably um, except as I like to hear about how simple the whole thing will be and the informed dissenters like to feel like there's some respect for their decision and if there's more information or facts that they've been unaware of then they'll respond to that too. Um, so these ideas came directly from the Māori women who were interviewed um, as part of the focus group. Um, and as you can see, a lot of the responses were really focused around family, which probably isn't much of a surprise to you all. Um, it, there was a suggestion that you try some humour too, so that's always good. Um, so that's a really brief overview with um, just some snippets of a study that was done for the Ministry of Health. Um, we're going to move on to an, act, an activity shortly. But first, I'd just like to mention um, the inaugural 2014 Cervical Smear Olympics that was held this year. <laughs> year, this year. Um, and I'd just like to acknowledge the participants. So is Katie here too? Mm -hmm. Can we just give Katie a round of applause? <laughs> is Katie here tonight? How many did she do? Is there anybody from Rauranga here tonight? Oh, okay, we'll have to put it in the post. There were, there were two winners, and so Katie was, as you can see, was a gold medalist for the priority woman category. And Alison. Alison. Yeah. Yeah. So there will be a 2015 Cervical Smear Olympics, so um, we'll let you really know cool. when that's happening. We might get into training for that. Okay. Okay, so this is why we've um, put you round tables. You thought you were going to get fine dining and wine, didn't you? Yes. But no, <laughs> you're not. Um, what we'd like you to do now is just to sit in your group around the table um, and just to think, I guess, and think in your own minds and visualise we're all women in the room and we all hopefully are getting our regular smears. And just to really put yourself in that position of what is what is important to you um, when you go and have your survival smear. Think the about on. yeah, we can turn the light on as well. Um, just have have a discussion around that. What we would like is like Jenny's done a lot of research around what's happening in other areas in New Zealand. We've got a pretty good idea of what what um, you know, looking at those personality types. Just maybe think about what your personality type is. What would it take? For your nurse, who you've got a really good relationship with, to encourage you to come in and have your survival smear on a regular basis. So have a discussion, and then I will sh I will stop you in about ten minutes. You have to know just before you go off that it was either this activity or a, a role play. Oh, so we opted for this rather than the role play because we couldn't get any volunteers. So um, just go ahead and in 10 minutes I'll stop and I'm going to ask you for three, three of the most important things that you can come up with in your group. Okay? I'll get you some stickies and you can put them on the stickies. Okay. Okay. So the question why Why bells? Okay. Supper is served? Supper is not served. <laughs> okay, so the first question, Jenny, you're tonight. She's put the question up there. What 
do you see as the barriers for having a smear from your own experiences, both as a woman and a nurse? <laughs> Discuss that and put down in your own experience. Yes. Think about it from your own experience. There's a saying about how do you understand what people feel unless you walk from their moccasins. So this is about putting yourself in that position. What, thinking about those personality types, what does it take? For example, I'm one of those ones up on the right of my box, but I carry my form around in my handbag for probably about three months before I actually go. So think about what you actually do. Um, hopefully you're doing this in Kaitaia and in the Bay of Islands as well.
ideas that you think could help and we will certainly be considering them. Okay, you've got another five minutes. I'm not going to read it out. Thank <laughs> you. 
So, um, Kai Tyre and Bay of Islands, we're just going to wrap this up. So, if you could just, um, in your group, give maybe three um, key, key of the main points when we come for the feedback, and um, we'll collate them up on the whiteboard down here, um, rather than having every, everything. Maybe just make your um, get your three priority points. Thank you. Okay, thanks everybody. A bit of discussion, that's great. Um, we're not going to be able to spend a lot of time on this, but um, amongst your group, if you could have a spokesperson, spokesperson. And um, maybe just give the top three that came up for you as a group is around the barriers. Um, thinking that from a personal perspective, what are the three and, and maybe put those forward. And Jenny will scribe and she'll tick them off with their common themes. So that's a part of good methodology for getting kind of emerging themes. So maybe, Shannon, can we start with your group over there? Yeah. Oh, I didn't mean particularly Shannon, but a spokesperson. <laughs> One of the well, one of the ones that I came up with was familiarity. So someone that knew my vagina. You, you, that you'd like to be, as you'd like to be familiar with your smear taker. Yes. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah. Important. So rapport and so you know and trust that person. Okay. One another two from that table. Cost. Cost of the smear. Cost. The cost is seen as um, as a what influences people with they come or not. Okay. Thank you. And one more. And um, what's that? Just uh, the barrier. Another barrier will be say if they can't come during the day. Is there could we do after hours? Okay. So so the restriction of hours can yeah of course people work. When do they have their smears done? We all close up at five. Is that as an excuse? Okay, um, I'm just going to going to flick to Kai Tyre. Have you got um, three that you would like to contribute? <laughs> Co uh, cost. Cost. Thank you. Yeah. The other one was mostly fear. Fear, fear. of results. Fear, fear of, of the results. Thank um, you. And fear of, of uh, past bad ex uh, experiences. Bad experiences. Yeah, okay. Great. Okay. In the past, previous. Thanks, Marilyn. Um, we'll skip to um, table two. Have you got anything to add? Anything that's not transport? Transport. Okay. And that comes up for for women. They say I can't get there because I haven't got transport. And um, hygiene. Um, hygiene. Women have been trying to get them in the afternoon. They'll say no. Shower. Right. And right. That has come through in a lot of research. Yeah. First appointment of the day. Yeah. Okay. So hygiene. Thank you. <laughs> Anything else from the table, Margaret's table at the back? Anything that's not been put up on the? Uh, child care. Yeah. Child care. Um, and I guess within that, are you thinking about how that you could cope with that if they bring their toddlers or mm -hmm. children in with them? You know, how is your how's your practice set up for that? Is that that's all part of that, I guess, isn't it? Yeah. They don't want to bring them with them. Yeah. Okay. I had uh, one woman decline because she said she didn't feel it was culturally appropriate and her body was tapu. I really didn't know what to say to that. Thank you. Thank you. Tapu, um, that cultural fuck am I? Um, yeah. Um, anyone else from the back table? I was going to say, adding to these, for the culture that's used to a lot of women prefer to be in a formal setting, you know, like venue. Right. Right, having a home or Marae or community or somewhere apart from a clinical setting. Yeah. Okay. Um, Judy? Um, nurses non judgmental. So, um, so, key is the relationship with the nurse, but the nurse is non judgmental about 
So the size of the poop stem. And right. The fact that they're laid into four smears or those of those who yeah. And they direct access, that ease of access is such a huge... Ease of access. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's great. Yeah, it's certainly... Um, and that goes back, that judgment goes back to a bad experience. One bad experience of feeling judged could be a lifetime of resistance to access. Yeah, really, and, really important. And the thing that I find in my role is because I do it for free, but I know, so I do get quite a lot of the hard to reach people, and cost is the number one issue. Cost is number one. Okay. For all people. Okay, table. Probably the only ones that we haven't covered with um, what you guys said already is um, the fact that they may have a history of sexual abuse or right. the opposite of depression or something else going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah. Yeah. sexual abuse or some yes. um, mental health. Um, yeah, but yeah. most of those have come out like the, the whole thing around that trust relationship and past experiences with a person was organised with her. Mm. Yeah, as it's the Thank you. Privacy. Privacy. Yeah, and there's a lot of giggling happening at this table, the naughty table. Um, would you like to share? <laughs> no. <laughs> what's, the, what's the language that you use? I don't language? Know mm -hmm. um, like communication. So if you've got somebody that doesn't respond well to highly clinical terminology, mm. yeah. <laughs> then you'd use more um, lay, lay language. language. And mm. then if you've got somebody who you know, maybe wants it to be a little bit more formal. Yes, so it's, it's all that assessment of gauging yeah. Yeah. what level, yes. Another one, another one was environment, you know, your room, like if yes. you're going to have your table pointing to the waiting room. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. very important. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's great. So I'll just check in with um, Kaitaia and Bay of Islands. Is there anything that we haven't covered that you've got any extras up there? Does there is there anything as far as rural rurality goes? Apart from the well, transport? it wasn't quite rurality, Mary, but it was um, they just lack of education, not realising the importance of the smears. Okay. Uh, okay. Awareness uh, and not understanding the importance. That's right, yeah. and the fact that it's it is a reasonably undignified experience for anyone, yeah. and yes. um, it's quite an invasive experience. And I know a lot of research has come out around smears cancer yeah. rather than smears wellness. Mm -hmm. No, and yes. that's how that is yeah. projected. Yeah, that's fantastic. I think all the rest has been covered. Okay, that's a really good point. Um, you know that whole experiential thing when they're young and and making it a, a you know starting really young and normalising it as a wellness check. Um, the younger the better, really, isn't it? So that that becomes a lifelong thing, lifelong thing that you do. Okay, so just the last, we're on the last, um, the second question, which of course is. Um, what approaches, uh, we'll just, uh, I'll open this up, we're not going to go round the room, has, um, what, what's one thing that's really worked for your practice that you would like perhaps more support to be able to do more? I know cost, and, and we've kind of addressed that through. After through, hours accessibility. So, after hours accessibility. Who has done after hour clinics for their women? Um, so, Onorahi? Yeah, offered an after hours? And did that work? I'm not sure. It's I'm not sure. Sort of okay. Marie was really focusing on what I'm doing. Okay. Has, has that worked for anyone in, in the um, mid and far north? Um, in your rural clinics, have you offered after hours services? Seekers! <laughs> Sorry? You can just say, Marie, you click on say that enough. Um, Wendy said that they have actually offered on their recall on their recall letters to ladies they have yes. actually offered an after hour service, but no one has right. ever responded to it. Okay, interesting. Yeah. Okay. Um, any other brilliant ideas? Take it. Take it. Take it. Take it. Take it.
Taking uh, the circles out, like last year we had the WANS women, women from WANS come up and do our update and she was, we were all green with envy because she was talking about the, the van that goes around. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we won't tell them what you called it, but um, you know, that's around another access issue, taking it out to communities, isn't it? <laughs> but we haven't got that. Something that's worked for me just, just in the last year is actually, if someone's overdue, is telling them they're overdue, then giving them a really good explanation about what it is, why we're doing it, and then just every other time I see them, bringing up it again, bringing it up again, so that now I've got a couple of women who haven't had SMEs for years that are now saying, okay, yeah, I'll have them. Yes. Because they've paid lots of them to do yeah. Yeah. Pounding, <laughs> pounding can work for some personality types. <laughs> no, but you, you've, told, you've explained it yes. to them and they are familiar with you yes. now. You yes. know, so they're a little bit more. Yeah. It's all about that communication and the core. Again, I think it's about going back to the personality types. I think that's really relevant. Yeah. Um, thinking about the personalities, how people respond. Everybody responds differently, and we, one size does not fit all. <laughs> we find, uh, sorry? We find, well, I find um, text messaging for our lot works text, really well. Text they messaging? Text message, and they, I know, when I've sent out texts, they the next week Great. too. Oh, Great. They seem to act on it straight away. Yep. You send a letter, oh yeah, I'll get round to it. Yes. I've got the phone in cool. the end. Social media is really busy phone too. Sorry? We need an outreach news like we do with the organisation. Well, Mary, please stand up, Beth. <laughs> um, does everyone know Beth Klingon? And Beth, of course, has been doing SMEARS forever, and she's an institution in herself. But, of course, Beth, do you want to just say who you work for now and that you can do those outreach? Sorry to put you on the spot. No, 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 that's all right. Um, I'm still working with Kiwara Nati Wai, but in a, in a different capacity, and of course we've got Marguerite, who's who's the Nati Wai, who's the um, nurse practitioner, but I'm doing SMEs from um, Te Pō Waitanga, and I've got a little study down at the Kōrasi School, I've been doing the need once a month, and we do do um, casual. So, you, so people could go there? Still always go back to the GP. Yes, okay. So that's, um, Beth works from a, it's a little state house down the road from the TPO clinic. Yeah. What's it called? It's got a lovely name. And, and what days do you do smears there? Um, it's a Monday, but it's an organised Monday yeah. at this stage. Yeah. So, I mean, what, the, the premise, the principle is that we, you know, you, you offer your enrolled population within your practice the full gamut of screening and smears is part of it. But some people in your practice may actually request a Māori smear taker. And so if they do, that's an option that they should be given. And that's where Beth can help out. Um, and know, a lot of women know Beth. And they know she does a really, really wonderful. So that's another option to think about. Um, Beth, if that was the case, would that... They make appointments through TPO for that, or how would how would the nurses? Yeah. To, yeah. Don't want you to be overrun. It has to Okay. Cool. Okay. So, any other brilliant ideas? Oh, we've got a brilliant idea up at Bay of Islands. A brilliant idea from the Bay of Islands coming in, coming in. Uh, yes. Coming in is brilliant. Well, not that brilliant. It's coming in. It's brilliant. <laughs> right. Um, we, we've, over several practices, they've offered um, $100 grocery vouchers, and we've even had women return early because they wanted to go in the drawer again. Um, so, <laughs> so sometimes it's um, a grocery voucher, and sometimes it's just a $100 voucher. Monthly. Monthly. Oh, it's a monthly drawer. The monthly drawer. And we have done that in the past. They have worked at TPO uh, for pamper packs and things. There's not yeah. a great deal of money to support that, but if you come up with a plan, a practice plan, because everybody's been asked to do it. We have a wonderful plan. The doctor paid for it. <laughs> oh, that's even better. There you go. <laughs> Um, it, did, it did work for a I think it did work, didn't it? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, Jenny, just remind me, do we need to give them any information about the practice plan? Um, yes, please, Mr.
There's more stuff going on. Okay, so we won't over. Right. So, any other last last good idea? Yes. Yes. Since it's uh, one of the priorities of the Ministry of Health, why don't they give us more money? Well, they've given you chocolates. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And don't worry, that is on the table. That is on the table. Yeah. So um, the only the last thing um, that I want to just um, the the Ministry of Health have asked us if there's any practice nurses, and you can come up to me afterwards. Don't need to show your hand. They're they're trying um, trialing an e-learning for HPV, and um, a lot of lot of learning is going on. Line and they want a couple of practice nurses to be able to trial it to see whether it's interactive enough. And if you are interested in doing that and you're happy for me to give the ministry your name, then please just come and say, Yes, Mary, I'll do that. Um, so that a lot of stuff can be done online for your updates in the future. This is what we, I mean, I love having you all together here, don't, don't get me wrong. Um, but we're looking at other ways to be able to reach people so they don't have to travel, etc. So um, we're just going to finish the um, evening tonight just to consider. Jenny, you, back to you, Deb. Oh, these were just a few things that were suggested as part of the, um, the feedback gathered in the, the research report I was talking about earlier. Um, and also, as Alison mentioned, um, the nurses that I've talked to who been particularly successful in hurting their women and have all said that um, the verbal approach has worked quite well for them, coming them on the phone. So, yeah. Cool. Can I just mention one other thing? I think that another thing that really needs to happen is that these sort of um, evenings are also offered to medical receptionists. Right. I think that that's, that's a good the first point of mm -hmm. contact. Mm -hmm. And I think that if they... Mm -hmm. um, so that they point. feel empowered and are able to ask mm. the question, not of every person that comes across, but yeah. you know what I mean? Mm. Like, good suggestion. <laughs> <laughs> would you agree with that? <laughs> Sorry, um, Donna. Donna's just got something to say. Shh, 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 shh. Well, Robert, I think you have absolutely correct. Thank you. In the UK, in fact, they did a really good study in one of the Midlands areas where their screening rates were really low as part of the National Survival Screening Program. And what they did was they put a video presentation in the, in the waiting room yes. about spheres and things, but they trained all the receptionists right. to ask every woman when they turned up, are you, or they checked on the thing, yeah. You're due for your smear. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, and it made a takes. phenomenal difference. Yeah. They also had some really good stuff aimed at young women yes. to increase the screening rates in young women. And when you say the younger the better, it's not. Please remember, not before 20. Not before 20s. That's it. Yeah. So, um, Jenny, Jenny had to have the last laugh. I put the cat in the catheter. Um, you can see the cat pictures. So that's it for tonight. I'd really like you to please fill your evaluation forms out and leave them with you if you would like to volunteer to do the e-learning. And I'd just like you, before you go, just to say goodbye to Kai Tyre in the Bay of Islands. Bye. Bye. Bye.